This week we're discussing Star Trek Beyond. This is episode five. You're listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco. The fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. Welcome to 70s Trek. Yes, it is the show that talks about all things Star Trek related in the 70s. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Casto. This week, we're talking about the new movie, Star Trek Beyond. You know, some of you might be asking, what does this have to do with Star Trek in the yeah. 70s? You know what? I've got an answer for you. It's a good one. Not much. But it's our show, so we're going to talk about it anyway. Yeah, and it's the 50th anniversary, so give us a break. That's right. Give us a break. I like that. Kelly's got a little edge to him today. Hey, before we get into that discussion, let me tell you how to find us. We encourage you to reach out. Give us your questions, your comments. You can find us at Facebook. That's facebook.com slash 70s Trek. That is 70S Trek. The JJ verse is alive and well. As we record this, it is the weekend that Star Trek Beyond has premiered in theaters. Wow, Kelly, I got to tell you, I was I was pretty impressed. How about you? I uh, absolutely. I I like the idea that we're starting to go down a little bit of a different path and recreating original series episodes. Yeah, you know what? I mean, right off the top, we find out that this is three years into their five-year mission. Holy crap. So the five-year mission, we're into it. This is it in this movie. We're there. Awesome. 966 days, actually. Oh, tell us about that. So a little homage to the the first episode being aired uh, of the original series. September 66. September 66. 966. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and in fact, and we'll talk about uh, some of that throughout this show, but there are little Easter eggs all through the movie that, that uh, call back to classic Star Trek references. It's really, really neat. So, you know, why don't we dive in? We'll just, uh, we'll just get going here. As we said, this is into the five year mission. So the five-year mission, five mission started. It started without the, the viewers seeing it, which is cool. That's not a big deal. And I thought it was interesting that we see Kirk feeling lost. Yeah, I mean, he says it right in his captain's log, early part of the movie. I, you know, we're three years in, we're 966 days out, and I'm not sure what my place is, is basically what he's saying. This And this is seems... To us, um, who love the original series, kind of out of place. I don't, I don't know. But what, do you, what do you think? I thought so, too. Um, y- the one thing about Kirk, he always seemed most at home in the captain's chair on the Enterprise. Uh, and, and in fact, early, early on in, in some of the early shows, he talks about all I've ever, all I've ever wanted was to do this. In fact, uh, the naked time. He is. Um, is it the naked time or the naked now? Naked now. Let's let me pick that up. The naked now. You know he has is been infected by that disease that causes him to be uh, to lose his inhibitions. A- and he says, you know, I love you. Basically, talking to the Enterprise, I'll never lose you. So yeah, to me. Um, he was a fulfilled person because he was captain. He was doing the thing he was supposed to do. But of course, that's a different Kirk, isn't it? It sure is. He has different motivations than than this in this universe. Yeah, exactly. His while his father and his father's service in Starfleet is an inspiration, you know, he says it. He says it to Bones. I joined Starfleet on a dare. So what am I doing here? 
And Bones says it perfect. You're living up to your father. And didn't you think that was a great moment? It sure was. You know, going back into the original series even, I loved those quiet moments when McCoy and Kirk would talk, and you really got to know both characters really well, going all the way back deep into the series. And and Wrath of Khan, one of my favorite moments in Wrath of Khan, here we are getting ahead of ourselves again, is when, is when McCoy visits Kirk in his apartment, and they have that one-to-one talk about growing old and, and, you know, regrets and things like that. Those are great moments. And glasses. And glasses, that's right. Um, it's interesting because this movie further cements that relationship also between Kirk and Spock, you know, and, and it... It's much more done through words that they say to each other or that they say to other people than what we see on screen. So it, it seemed to me like the writers needed to say, hey, look, this Kirk and Spock thing, we need to make it tighter. Um, but, you know, Spock is off with McCoy for much of this movie. But it's McCoy that brings them together. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. It is. Did you notice... Uh, and, and again, we don't want to give away too much. We're not going to give away the endings, but we're going to talk a- about a few things. Hopefully, if you're listening to our show and you like Star Trek, you've already seen the movie. We'll talk about a few things, though. We know that there is a USS Franklin. That's been publicized in, in teaser trailers and, and uh, articles. There's a USS Franklin, which is an older ship. In the movie, they say it's a Warp 4 ship, which, you know, that places it before the NX-01 Enterprise. Yeah. Right, they, and they even reference it. It's over a hundred years old. Yeah, very cool, very cool call back to the show Enterprise. At one point, there's a video playing on board the Franklin. They dug up this old <laughs> video. Did you notice the shuttle pods? Yes. Yeah, the NX01 yes. shuttle pods. Yes. Ah, oh, that's a fun call back. Very cool reference. Uh, at one point, somebody talks about the Zindi and the Earth Romulan War, also. Right. Lots of great, great Trek references. Kelly, you know, what do you have in your notes? Uh, well, I'm, I'm conflicted. How much do you give? Do we just lay it all out or? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that we should lay everything out, but we can, we can hint. Okay. Um, was, so there was a lot of, I think, character building in this. It, all the way from, you know, Kirk and Spock and even McCoy, as we've talked about already. But then there's Sulu. Oh, wow. Yeah. We can talk about Sulu. Cause, so. Because that's out in the in the press. Um, right. How did you feel about Sulu being gay? I, actually, I, I thought it was awesome. I mean, it was also kind of a nod to um, the original Sulu, not the, his character. But George um, Decay. Yeah, George Decay. You know, so I like that. I, I, You know what? And I was fine with it, too. It's it's a bit of a surprise, the fact that it, it is from a character that we um, have known for 50 years. Um, and George Decay even, um, I don't want to say he was upset, but he, he kind of said, look, uh, we know who Sulu is. We know Sulu is not gay. I, you know, I never played him that way. I played him as a straight guy. You know, there's a, there's a scene where they're in Star Trek Five, where they're walking around, following and looking at the butt of a beautiful Klingon woman. Right. Yes, he was looking at her butt. Yes. Uh, so George Decay, a gay man, actually said, "I'm not sure this was the best move." But you know what? If if the franchise is going to introduce gay characters um, or, or lesbian characters or, you know, there's the whole LGBT, and I guess we had Q on the end now too, um, then perhaps one of the smoothest ways, one of the most organic ways to introduce that, that is through an established character. It, wouldn't it seem very artificial to say, hey, here's a new guy on the, on the ship. He's part of the crew. His name's Joe. Oh, and he's gay. That's just the gay character Joe over there. That would seem a little weird, wouldn't it? 
<laughs> yeah, just you don't do it like that. No, exactly. So the fact, at least not now, right? Th- there hasn't been anything really over the top to suggest that Sulu is straight or gay, a- and so it was probably a very easy way to do this. Um, and, and I really do think that they were probably um, p- paying tribute to George Takei in, in a way, in a fashion. Um, and the fact that he came out against it probably surprised them. But that's just my guess. I think you're right. Uh, so there, you know, there was a little tidbit here. If you saw the interview with... Um, Sorry, uh, with John Cho um, about this, and he was a little upset that they cut out a part in the script where they actually kissed. Did I, I you can catch see that. I, I did hear about that, right? And I can see why. Um, I can see both sides of that. I can see why they uh, would cut it out, and I can also understand why he would be upset. I think um, the studio is probably saying. Let's do this in small steps. Let's go small baby steps. We introduce the fact through a shot, uh, you know, of Sulu with his partner. Let's take this in small little pieces and then maybe do more in the next movie. I think that's okay. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Okay. Whew. We got through that. Can I get a little little crowd cheer for getting through that? Thank you. Thank you. Those are five people in the studio. They're doing, I don't know why you're here. You should probably go home. Hey, There's Joe, back to there, see. you're a little loud. A little bit loud. You need to calm down, sir. Hey, did you catch the reference? I loved this. To the episode, Who Mourns for Adnaeus? When they talk about the green hand in space. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. So many little references like that. I thought that was really, really neat. Um, and I guess we ought to talk about um, Nimoy and Nimoy's Spock character a little bit. Obviously, Leonard Nimoy, he passed in 2015. Um, boy, that's a... We'll talk more about Leonard Nimoy and his impact um, in a future episode. But, but clearly, the Nimoy-Spock character, you know, had a big impact on, on the Quinto-Spock character. And, and when he hears the news that the Nimoy Spock has passed away, he's pretty torn up by that. And, uh, you know, I thought that it was neat that he says at one point, well, I want to live a life like he did. I want to make an impact. And you can jump in here anytime you want. Okay. <laughs> I'm hanging on a bridge. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking out here, and I'm on a branch, and then I'm, a, I'm just hanging. Down <laughs> you still have one leaf you can hold on to there. I'm hanging on to the leaf. Uh-oh, it's starting to tear. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Ca- help me, I'm, Kelly. Catch me. I'm just debating on how much to say. It's tough. It is tough. It is tough. Well, let's just say this. There's a, um, there's a nice moment that pays tribute to the original crew. Uh, that's all we're going to say. But that moment, I don't know about you, um, I, I teared up. I, I went to the movie with my son and his girlfriend. His girlfriend, a, uh. tr- a Trek fan. She's a very good lady. Let's hear it for her. She's a great lady. Hey, hey. Thank you. Okay. I think that's enough. You need to go home. Um, b- but I teared up. And you'll know, if you've seen the movie, you will you know what I'm talking about. Or if you go see the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. I'm verklempt. <laughs> Just thinking about it. So I was, after seeing the movie, I was reading through some, some um, articles and things like that. And, and this I missed because I don't read Vulcan, but supposedly... <laughs> In the Vulcan language, there is a, a description of Idik. You know, it's, it says in one of the things that young Spock is looking through, it says infinite diversity and infinite combinations, and it's written in Vulcan script. Well, you know, I, I don't read Vulcan, so I didn't catch it, but very cool. That is. Very nice. 
and I'm sure uh, at the end of the picture you noticed, as well as I did, that the film was dedicated to Leonard D. Moy and, and Anton Yelchin, yeah. which, uh, yes. which I thought was appropriate. Yes, that just sent me right over the edge. It was. It was touching. It was very, uh, and it was very nicely done. Um, I thought this would be a good time to talk about some of the actors. Do you have any notes on, um, on some of their performances? Um, well, I not, not maybe performances, um, but just more background on their characters. So, which again, I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> well, dive in, young man. Well, so the um, just lingering on that the reference to all the references back a hundred plus years to before the Federation was created so that just eye-opening i think i wish i they would have had more detail but um and the captain of that the uss franklin right like more detail there yeah these were more call outs than they were direct ties but they're references and they're in there and that's it's nice to see that the um the franchise moving forward is paying tribute to the things that have come before. And I, and I like that. I thought that was really, really neat. I, I kind of had an interesting take on Chris Pine. Um, in the first movie, it's clear that, that Pine is trying to pay tribute to William Shatner's Kirk. Not through the whole movie, but there are a few times when you catch Pine doing a few things that Shatner would do. Yes. The way he sat in the chair. Or the way he um, smiled. Shatner has this way of, when he is Kirk, of smiling with his mouth closed. And it's very endearing. And Pine did that in the 2009 movie. Um, I think Pine is, I'm guessing, I don't know this, so please don't yell at me on Facebook. But I think Pine might be moving away from that interpretation now after a couple of movies. And, and creating a Kirk that's his, which, which is totally okay. It's totally okay. But I kind of get the impression that he's moved past Shatner's interpretation of the character and is doing something different. Carl Urban, on the other hand, oh, my God, does he inhabit <laughs> McCoy or what? Oh, my gosh. He, this was peppered with McCoyisms. I love it. First of all, I love the McCoy character. I always have. I, I love it when DeForest Kelly was on screen and he was just being classic McCoy. And I love when Carl Urban is doing the same thing. He just chews the scenery. You can tell he's having fun, and it's fun for him. It's fun for us as fans. It's for, yeah, absolutely. I, I liked how he went back to his country doctor roots. Yeah. And, you know, you, you all know what that means. Yeah, exactly. Fun stuff. Carl Urban does a great job. I think Yelchin did another great job as Chekhov, too. He has a different twist on Chekhov. But did you catch the joke at the end of the movie? There's a, at the end of the movie, the crew's together. They're having uh, a get-together. And Chekhov says to somebody, Did you know scotch was invented by a little old lady in Leningrad? Yeah. <laughs> And that is a direct line from the original series. Yes. Yes. Very nice. Very nice reference. Well, and they, and they kind of built that one up, too. Yes. A little bit. That's right. So we shouldn't say too much more, I guess. I guess not. Sophia Butella. She was Jayla in the movie. She's obviously the, the, you know, the character that you need another protagonist to move the story along. I thought she was fun, you know? She was fun Absolutely. to watch. Very pretty Absolutely. woman. And wow, what an awesome fighter. Those fight oh, sequences yeah. were incredible. Yep. She she did a gr great job. I mean, just looking at her background a little, she, um, I think she was a dancer. And then she was in, um, she was in a, a recent movie that she had blades for her legs. What was that movie? Um, uh, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with her. I did a little research. 
you know, getting ready for this show, I wasn't that familiar with her. That's okay. We can come back to that. Yeah, we can come back to that. I'll just break in when I. That's right. That's right. Realize uh, who it was. Zachary Quinto did another great job as Spock. Um, there was a there was a point in this movie where he laughs. Now, my experience in Star Trek is that you should beware of the laughing Vulcan. <laughs> it's not a good sign when a Vulcan laughs. Usually not. Usually not. This time it worked out okay. Typically, and, and it's so funny because that's what went through my mind as I'm watching the movie. Oh, crap, he just laughed. We're all in trouble. Well, and I think the McCoy character did the same thing. He did. But, you know, he's human. It's okay when he laughs. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Hey, what did you think of the Yorktown Space Station? Holy crap. That was incredible. I, I mean, whoever conceived that thing, oh, they, they, they broke the mold of what we think a space station is supposed to look like. That was incredible. Uh, it to me it almost was are they this advanced that they could build a station like this yeah it, it really really is advanced it reminded me you know those pictures those um like mind puzzle pictures yes. of stairways that go up and then all of a sudden they take a right turn but they're actually then going down you know right. they quite, kind of mess with your brain a little bit and that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly the way the station is laid out you think you're going one direction, and all of a sudden you're going the opposite direction. And yeah. it's a bit of mind bleepery when you look at this station. Well, it was, I mean, for us techie types, you're looking at it, and it's, hey, this is really cool. I mean, this is one of the only deep technical things they really had in the movie, I thought. It, it was very, very cool. Um, how the... Uh, it is a base for starships. Starships enter the station, but how they enter the station, you know, and they're, how they inhabit the station once they're inside, oh, that was really cool. That was really, really cool. The whole thing was cool. What did you think of the design of the USS Franklin? Outside of the, the rust color, <laughs> um, I, I actually kind of like kind of liked it. it. It actually had that old feel. Yeah. Definitely a callback to the NX-01 Enterprise. Yes. Um, and and definitely it, it was a, a step further back from that design, you, you know, which is obviously is what it was meant to be. Um, very neat. Very neat to see it, though. Um, I thought it was fun that, that we, we get that callback back to the show Enterprise, as we said earlier. I got to tell you, though, I, I enjoy the J.J. Verse movies. My credo is this. I, you know, I grew up with the original series. I loved it, the next gen. I loved all of the movies. You know, I, I loved DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise. To me, to me, any Trek is better than no Trek. Amen. So... I don't really get upset like some purists do. That's not Kirk and Spock, so I'm not watching it. You know, I mean, you know, J.J. is ruining the franchise. You know what? J.J.'s not ruining the franchise. J.J. is just reinterpreting it. And that's the beauty of this format of Star Trek. It can be reinterpreted pretty easily and pretty believably. So... When I offer criticism here, I, I don't want people to think, oh, he's just a J.J. verse hater. I, I'm really not. I'm really not. If I do have a criticism, it's this. Dude, I want to see the ships more. I, wa I want to <laughs> see a clear vision of what this thing looks like. They jump in this thing. They fly it. I don't think I'm giving anything away here. No. But we never get a clear image of what this ship, the Franklin, looks like. Come on, show us the darn ships. Uh, that's one of the things that irked me the most about the 2009 movie. All of the shots were compressed as if it was zoomed in. And so it took the image of the Enterprise and compressed it, and it changed it. 
that and the damn lens flares. Thank you for not including any lens flares in this movie. I do not have the same headache I had when I walked out of the 2009 film. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Well, Justin Lin directed this one, so JJ only produced. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, I'm glad that edict wasn't passed down. Uh, You need at least 75 lens flares, and you're going to have to work those (laughs) in. Thank you for not passing down that edict. That said, hey, it's a great movie. I love the references. Absolutely adore what they did with this movie. I'm going to go see it again. Just once? No, probably not. No. Probably a couple of times. They need to hurry up and get it on DVD so I don't have to pay to see it again. Yeah, you want to bet it'll be out for Christmas? You know it will. So, so did so Bob, did you see this in 3D? I didn't. Did you? I did not either. I'm just curious. Yeah, me too. And I was thinking about that too. And I can see like on the space station where you had things sort of flowing in in front of the camera where that would be kind of cool in 3D. My experience with 3D has been um, if it's a movie shot in 3D for 3D, then it's usually a schmaltzy movie. It's usually not that good of a story. And those movies that are story driven that also are 3D, eh, it's okay. I'm, you know, it's not, I'm not, I'm not losing anything by not seeing it in 3D. I almost would rather just see the film and enjoy the film. So right. that's kind of where I am these days about 3D. Yeah, that's about where I'm at. And, and 3D always makes it a little darker too. A little bit. Yeah. That's so. definitely why I did not see Into Darkness in 3D. It was already dark. It was already dark. Was the already name dark. says it's dark. Yes, yes. Hey, so just rewind a little bit. Sophia, she was in Kingsman, The Secret Service. That's where right. She had, she had blades for her legs. Oh, my gosh. That was her? That was her. Wow. Okay. So incredible action star, you know, um, played her, and she she did a great job acting, I thought, too. Didn't you love how um, here's this this poor wounded character? She's been stuck on this world by herself, um, and at one point the uh, the the bad guy crawl he says to her, you know, and he's talking about the Enterprise crew. You know, they're gonna leave you here, don't you? They're gonna abandon you. And nobody in our crew hears that, but Kirk goes out of his way to save her, you know, and and kind of restore her faith. I thought that was very cool. Very well done. I thought so, too. What else you got? You have any other notes? Hey, so the script. Let's talk about the script. Sure. So I'm, I, now I didn't know who wrote the script before the movie. And I'm getting through the credits, and I'm like, Simon Pegg. Oh, my gosh. I love Simon Pegg. Boy, he's Everything so he does. He's so talented, isn't he? He, he is. So, so Simon Pegg... Um, and Doug Jung, I think that's how you say that, um, they wrote the, the screenplay, but they weren't the first writers of the screenplay. There was an original uh, screenplay by, um, oh, let's see, Roberto Orci, I think. Roberto Orsi, right, who's a Orsi. very, uh, yeah, he's in tight, he's on JJ's team. Yep, yep, um, and along with Patrick McKay and John Payne. And Paramount said that script was too Star Trekky. Oh, um, so they they brought in Simon Pegg and Doug to write another script. Now they they um, the first three they get given writing credits. Um, if you go through the credits, you should see their name. Um, but really, Simon and Doug did not use any of their script. They didn't even read the script before they wrote theirs. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that just sound like... uh, I have to be careful how I say this. You know, in Star Trek history, we hear these stories about how the studio or the network didn't get it, didn't understand 
what drove fans to it. Didn't understand what worked and didn't work. Heck, they they canceled Enterprise after four seasons because the brass admitted at the time, uh, we, you know, we really don't get this show. Uh, I'm talking about the brass at the um, at the network. We really don't get this show. It does, yeah, so we're going to get rid of it. And in the fourth season of Enterprise, that show was really doing well. It did. It came back. It, it came back. back hard. Yeah, yeah. So this just has that same ring to it. Uh, we don't get this. This is a little too trekky. Maybe you should redo this again. There's one thing you have to remember, though. If it's too trekky, that's what attracts the fans. Exactly. That's why we we love this stuff. Right. So don't are, don't don't ab- you think they're they're trying to bring in others though, right? Not just trekkies. And I get that. And and I t- to be honest with you, I think this movie does a great job of that. This movie does a great job of offering something new, while at the same time serving up those classic references that that you know we all went. Did you hear that? He said green hand, you know, that we all get excited for. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think this movie did a good job of that. But, yeah, let's not worry about things being too trekky. Right. <laughs> hey, just a side note or Easter egg, if you will. Um, Doug Jung was the, let's see, the Ben character in the movie. You might not know who oh, Ben was he really? is. What, yeah, who was Ben? Ben is Sulu's husband. <gasps> really? So you see him briefly a couple times. Wow. That's really, really interesting. And, and how about that? They had kids. Yeah, they had one daughter. Yes. Now, I'm assuming that she is the daughter who will be on the Enterprise B at some point. He, I think that's yet to be determined. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> But we can we can guess at that. Yeah, I think overall it was uh, it, I think it was a better um, movie than the second Into Darkness. Uh, and I think it's a lot more enjoyable to watch. Definitely more enjoyable. I mean, don't get me wrong. I liked Into Darkness. I've watched it. I don't have enough fingers and toes, but um, but yeah, I like like that movie a lot. But it's this is enjoyable. It is. And, and I think, uh, again, not trying to diss into darkness at all. You could put this movie, though, immediately behind the 2009 movie and just continue things forward and it would have worked. Yep, absolutely. This would have been an, an interesting uh, second movie. Um, but it's all good. Into Darkness is still good. It's a, that's the beauty of Star Trek. If you look at the motion picture versus Wrath of Khan versus The Voyage Home. Very, very different movies, different tones, um, different pacing, yet they all work. Star Trek doesn't have to be one thing. Right. Well, it, and in this movie, like we've talked about numerous times, has lots of Easter eggs and references to the original series. Um, you know, uh, Into Darkness was more in your face. Here's, you know, homage to the original series. Yep. So so I kind of like that. Every time we watch it, we're going to catch something new. That's right. I don't know, Cal. I think it was a winner overall. I think so, too. Yep. I'm and I'm going to see it two or three thousand more times. <laughs> I don't even want to think. You know, it's funny, too. You say that. I don't want to even try to count the number of times I've seen Wrath of Khan. That, that's my favorite in the movies uh, franchise. And I, I'll, I've seen it so many times. Uh, I don't even think about how many. <laughs> so, so think about this, Bob. So I'm a gamer. So in a online game, they give you, uh, how long have you played this character? Well, think about how many times you've watched the movies or how much time you've spent watching it. You, you're in your decades, I'm sure, end to end. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but think about that. You know, don't, I don't, and, and don't discuss it with your wife. I mean, I don't want people to think I get up and watch Star Trek all day. You know, I have a job. I go to work. I've got three kids. We do family things. Um, 
for me, Star Trek has been along with me through my life's journey. It's been something that I turned to when I was a kid for fun. Later on in junior high and high school, I turned to it because I appreciated the message and the inspiration. In college, uh, I turned to it um, because of my appreciation for it in totality. And then I, I came back to it over the years at different times. Months go by. Uh, years have gone by, to be, to be honest, where I haven't watched anything. And then something, you know, reawakens inside him is like, I think I need to watch the Corbomite maneuver tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Baylock. Let's see what happens again this time. So, but it's, it, I was thinking about it because I knew at some point we would talk about this. It's, um, it's been like a friend that's, that's gone with me through life. Right. Right. It's my comf- comfort zone. It's where I go and I feel like a kid again, but also makes me think. Nice. I like the way you put that. Yes. Instead of eating comfort food, uh, I'm consuming uh, comforting content. That's exactly. a great way to look at it. And I'm probably eating comfort food while I do it. So, OK. Well, there's that. There's that, too. <laughs> too funny. Hey, thank you for listening this week. We had a ball talking about Star Trek Beyond. Um, I'd love to read your comments. Please visit us over at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash 70s Trek. Tell us what you think. And I hope you'll join us next week. Next week, we're talking about another one of those key influences. This one is Apollo 11. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s.